Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10. Chapter 10. I told uh, Paula Gradney, who works in our adult Christian education department, that we could do without the maps now if they needed them somewhere else. I may write a word occasionally or a phrase that we need to look at in greater depth. Uh, but if you're new with us, let me simply uh, tell you that Paul is writing to Christians in Rome whom he does not know. Um, we will get next into letters that he wrote to people whom he did know. And is often in the, these coming letters addressing specific problems and concerns in the churches that he's helped to establish. But he's not been to Rome. This is not a part of his experience when he writes the letter. He will get there, of course, as we learned in the book of Acts. He will get there, and though Acts doesn't tell us, we're pretty sure he died there under the persecutions of the Caesar Nero, as did Peter, uh, both of them probably in the early 60s, about 62 or 63. The oldest gospel we have is Mark's gospel, and the earliest scholars ever date Mark is around 68 or 69. So Paul is doing all of his writing before the four gospels get written. Because he does not know the people in Rome, and he doesn't know that situation very well, he uses this letter to spell out to them pretty much what he believes. Uh, in seminary, they would call this Paul's credo, his I believe. I believe. And he spells it out here wonderfully well. He will do it again, I think, really well in his letter to the Galatians. Uh, much briefer work, only six chapters there. Romans has 16. But both of them very important letters, and we're trying to take a look at the most important segments in this letter. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for our bishop who preached to us last Sunday, who led our annual conference so wonderfully well, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We know this week he has a big job of presiding over the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference, and we pray that will go really well also. We're praying for our bishop every day as he faces prosthetic cancer surgery at MD Anderson on June 18. We pray that we open your book now and we understand what we're reading and that we apply what we're learning to the living of our lives. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Okay, at the point we're going to pick up today, Paul has just said to the church at Rome, Moses told you that righteousness comes from Torah. Now, this is a very important word to Paul, as you've already seen, and it will be in other letters, because this is a really important word in Judaism. In Greek, the word is dikaiosune, dikaiosune and it literally means... I think this is more helpful. Because when we use the word righteousness, we sometimes get the idea that only a Mother Teresa or somebody was righteous. But that's not true. Um, this year at the Holocaust Remembrance Service at Temple Israel, uh, Dr. Paldiel, uh, Mordecai Paldiel, was speaker. For 25 years, he headed the special task force in Jerusalem trying to authenticate stories of righteous Gentiles. And he told story after story after story that night, wonderfully presented uh, what he had been able to learn. Not nearly all he learned in 25 years, but a few of the things he had learned. Um, where they could authenticate, yes, this person, this family, this group did something to save Jews during the Holocaust. So in Jerusalem at Yad Vashem Museum, they have a long row of beautiful trees. And they're continuing to add rows and rows of those trees. And at the base of every tree, there is a plaque. And this tree is planted here, dedicated to a righteous Gentile. And all they mean by that is somebody who did the right thing. Somebody did the right thing to save a Jew. And they've tried to 
uh, authenticate and document as many of those as they can. They want those people to be remembered. Dr. Paldiel said, we have the Holocaust remembrance every year because we don't ever want people to forget what happened. But the names we want them to concentrate on now are the righteous ones who helped us. We don't want the last word to be to those horrible people who perpetrated this crime against humanity, specifically against Jews. We want people to know the names of the righteous, the righteous ones. So this is a very important word. Now, two things here. How does one stand right with God? And how does one stand right with other people? Both of those things are involved. Now, Moses asked... Do you get this from Torah or do you get this from some other source? And what has he been arguing? He's been arguing that 800 years, not 800, 600, sorry, from about 1800 down to 1200 when Moses lived, 1800 when Abraham lived, already Abraham and Sarah were granted status as righteous before Moses and Torah ever came. Now, Paul assumes what he's been taught by Gamaliel, that is, that Moses wrote the first five scrolls. We now know that's not true. He didn't. Uh, Doesn't make them any less uh, authentic or real for us. Doesn't make them any less scripture for us, these first five scrolls. But we know Moses didn't write them. And if you go ask Rabbi Charles Sherman, you go ask Rabbi Mark Fitzerman, either one, sit down with them and say, who wrote the first five scrolls? They'll talk about J-E-D-N-P, just like the best Christian scholars do. J wrote part, E wrote part, and D wrote part, and P wrote part. That's what's in the, in the Torah. But go with him anyway in his argument. Bef- and, of course, those four wrote long after Moses. So that's where I was coming up with the J-E-D-N-P. The J didn't get written till till 800 years after Abraham. Nonetheless, go back. He's saying, did right standing come with Torah and Moses, or was right standing not already a part of the human condition with Abraham and Sarah? And Abraham and Sarah, you remember, are the founders of the Jewish community. Everything before Abraham and Sarah in in, in Jewish scripture is about how all things came to be. How all things came to be, how God wonderfully made everything, and then how everything just went berserk. God washed it out one time with a flood, said he'd never do that again. All that happens before you get to Abraham and Sarah. And then with Abraham and Sarah, you have an old man, old woman, no children. God comes by and asks them to trust him. What did did we decide about Adam and Eve? Problem with first homo sapien was they didn't trust God. They trusted a talking snake. And this not trusting... One of my professors insisted we use the expression unfaith. This unfaith caused them to do all kinds of bad things. On one page, you have first humans eating forbidden fruit. And on the next page, what? Murder. Cain and Abel. Murder. I mean, not trusting God turns bad quickly. That's the point of the Bible. All right. Let's go back. Paul is trying to get these Gentiles of the Roman Empire, and the Romans control the Mediterranean world in Paul's time, trying to get these Gentiles into the kingdom of God, into the community of faith. And he is convinced that they will not subscribe to everything in Torah. They're not going to eat kosher. These 50-year-old men are not going to let somebody get at them with their little sharp razors to be circumcised. So he's saying, you don't have to be circumcised. You don't have to eat kosher in order to come into the kingdom of God. Abraham and Sarah later... Abraham turned to circumcision, but not at the beginning. Paul's very clear. In the beginning, it was a matter of trust. And that they trusted God was going to give them this baby. The next morning, rolled up their their bed rolls and packed up their tents and moved 400 miles. She wasn't pregnant. Not yet. Several years passed before the long-awaited gift came, Isaac. Okay, that's the point he's trying to make. He, as a Jew, has been taught well by Gamaliel 
a grandson of one of the greatest rabbis in Hebrew history. Both rabbis here would agree. Hillel was one of the greatest ever. Gamaliel is a grandson of his. Very well respected. Right standing comes for Jews by doing Torah. Paul is saying to a Gentile world, you can be made right with God as Abraham and Sarah were before Torah ever came. Is that clear? I'm probably over laboring at this point, but, but that's the crux of it, you see. Uh, he says, though you Romans, Greeks, Mediterranean folk are not blood kin to us, you are children of Abraham and Sarah as we are if you have faith the way they did. If you move from unfaith to faith, then you can be counted right. All right, let's go back. So how are we counted right with God? Paul is very clear about this. Martin Luther got it 500 years ago. Sola fide, sola gratia, he wrote. It's grace alone and faith alone. God's grace means unmerited love. Love stands at the door and knocks, the book of Revelation says. If you open the door, love will come in. And this love we've seen most clearly in Jesus of Nazareth. For us Gentiles, this is the clearest revelation we have. Rudolf Bultmann, authentic revealer, authentic revealer, authentic revealer. Jesus of Nazareth, Mary's child, this is the one in whom we see the unmerited love of God. So that's why Billy Graham had millions of people saying all those years, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. I don't come boasting of anything I have done or will ever do. I come because I've come to believe God loves me and I need to be loved. I receive God's gift. If you do that, you stand right. You're a righteous person. Now, how do we stand right with people? And here again, the Bible is very clear. Our Christian scriptures are very clear. You do agape. Our bishop, right here, Tuesday night, washed the feet of ordinance. You read that article in the paper yesterday. It was well done. When our bishop told those of us who were planning annual conference with him way last fall that he was going to do that, you know, I sort of went, oh, no. I'd never seen this done in all of my life. I'd never seen a foot washing in a worship service. Never. And I really, I mean, I know the Pope does this every year. I don't, I don't downplay that. I've just never seen it personally. And so I thought, oh, gee, it just sounded a little schmaltzy to me somehow. But it wasn't. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. The bishop had told us sort of how he envisioned this. And so we had done all the gathering up of stuff. And at that right moment in the worship service, right after these, have, this was one thing that was almost eerie. Six months ago, the bishop didn't know how many were going to be ordained. I mean, some get a little behind in getting their final paper in. Some get, I mean, different things. When we got right down to how many to be ordained, guess, 12. Exactly 12, as with the disciples. All right, so at that moment, as the hymns being sung, a bench was brought in for the ordinance to come one at a time. They've been told what's going to happen, so they've got their shoes off, and if they're guys, they've got their pant legs rolled up a little bit, and they came one at a time. The bishop had mentioned a chair. We had a chair for him, and he sat in the chair, and then you could tell he didn't quite feel comfortable, and he just quietly pushed it back and got down on his knees on this hard marble. And on his knees, on this hard marble, we had a beautiful basin we'd gotten, and a matching beautiful pitcher and he poured water and we had 12 towels for him and he washed the feet of each one and dried them and handed that towel to them. They came and sat down. That camera right there was catching all of it from a side. You could see tear on the bishop's cheek. 
His handsome black face, you could see that tear coming right down, dripping off his chin. He was serious. And so the, in, the ordinands were serious. And that made all of us really serious. The night Jesus did that for the twelve, he said, This I command you, mandatus in Greek, from which we get Monday, Thursday, mandatus. Politicians love this word, mandate. You've given me a mandate to do all sorts of things. You've told me you want me to do this. Well, Jesus said, by this shall people know you're my disciples. You do agape for each other. And so where servants, slaves, normally wash people's feet, the son of the Almighty, down on his knees, washing dirty feet of his disciples. Okay. So, how do we stand right with others? We do agape. Yes, Dr. Swafford. He said he had, at general conference in Fort Worth four years ago, there was a service at one of the break times where people who wanted to participate could go. I had a committee meeting all. I didn't go, and I didn't see it. He said he had done it there. And uh, four years later, he decided to do it here in Oklahoma. So it, it was a it was a first uh, for for these Oklahomans, and it was a first for me too. I'd never seen it done before. Okay, so we're down to this word agape, and you know we've defined this over and over. But let me try again. The Greeks were very wise in a lot of things, and one of the ways they were wise was knowing that one word for love doesn't get it done. I mean, you see these rock and roll stars with sweat pouring off of them and crosses hanging around their neck and they've been sexually gyrating all over the stage. I love you. I love you. All of you. Greeks said, "Uh, no, no, no. That's not what Jesus was talking about. So they have three very important words. One is eros. It's a good word in Greek. Here we have used it in the word erotic, and that often means something tawdry and cheap. And Not in Greek. In Greek, it's a very wonderful thing. It's sexual, physical attraction. The Greek simply meant you see a woman that's beautiful to you. You see a guy who's handsome to you. You see some other person who's attractive, physically attractive to you. That's a good word. The word philios we have in Philadelphia. Adelphia comes from Adelphos, brother. So it's brotherly love, or in English we would say friendship. So I had a wedding here last night. Groom, OSU cowboy. So, corsages, orange. Boutonnieres, orange. (laughs) They're buddies. These six guys were buddies. Oklahoma State University cowboy buddies. That's fine. It's fine. Sorority sisters, fraternity brothers, Masonic Lodge, Boy Scouts. There are all kinds of organizations that do really good things in helping people who like similar things come together. Uh, Gail had a distant cousin in our first church, uh, who was a fox hunter. He was a much older man. And uh, on his mailbox, he had this little foxhound. And I didn't really know the significance. So uh, one day I said to him, Mr. Hightower, why do you have that foxhound up on your other hound? I just said, dog. Why do you have that dog on your mailbox? Well, because I'm a fox hunter. And one fox hunter recognizes another fox hunter. And a fox hunter should come by my house and be hungry. He knows he can knock on my door and Sarah and I'll feed him. Okay? That's what philios means. Good word. Nothing wrong with that at all. I like to chase fox, so other folks who chase foxes, they're good folks. My kind of people. Well, that wasn't what Jesus was talking about. The word agape is not a feeling. That's the first thing you need to remember. It's not a feeling. Eros is a feeling. You can fall in love. Friendship can be a feeling. You like people who like what you like. 
Agape is a decision of the mind. Jesus didn't say that night he's washing feet. I command you to fall in love with each other. I command you to find each other attractive. What he said was, I command you to do what I'm doing, and that's to put myself out, to humble myself. He didn't say all these words, but that's what he's doing. He's down on his knees like a doulos in Greek, a doulos, a servant or a slave. He's been telling him this the whole three years. Who's more important, he said. When you go to a dinner, who's more important? The people sitting at the head table? The person waiting tables. We all know it's the persons at the head table. But I am among you as one who waits on tables. You want to be one of mine? You wait on tables. You wait on tables. That is, he's saying, if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. If you humble yourself, your God will exalt you. This morning while I'm shaving, i got the little television in the bathroom on behind me. See if the world's blown up. They're all talking about the Queen. 60th anniversary of the Queen's taking over. A thousand boats coming down the Thames River. A thousand boats coming down the Thames. Amazing. And then, just as I'm straightening my tie and everything... Here's a story from right here in the United States. A middle school having a spring fun day at school, all kind of athletic contest, and a little boy who has cerebral palsy. And one of the contests is a 400-meter run. That's a long way. I used to hate that. Hated it. My football coach made me run track. And he wanted me to run the 400 meter. It's called a 440 back when I was in high school. 440 yards. It was gosh awful. Once around the track as hard as you can run. This kid signed up for the, for the 400 meter run. He has severe cerebral palsy. Mind is really, really good, but it doesn't tell his muscles just how to work. And his mother was right there. He started off. And at about 100 yards, he's starting to fail. Little legs going all kinds of ways. And kids who had already finished looked around and saw him. And they just started running back. And they got right behind him and were applauding and cheering and applauding and cheering. Until that kid made it. It took him nearly four minutes. A long time for a 400-meter race. The whole school... Applauding for this kid. Throwing their arms around him, hugging him when it was over. You put yourself out for a child of God. You root for somebody who needs you. Cheer on somebody who needs you. But it doesn't always mean saying yes. It doesn't always mean saying yes. Gail and I were riding the trains in Europe, Italy specifically. On almost every train, and we had a 10-day pass, so we could ride all the trains we wanted to in 10 days out of two months. Of course, we weren't there that long. You have to write down, you know, in your little thing, every day that you're writing, they punch a hole in it when they come by to check. Okay, so we were on 10 different trains. We used them all. We rode 10 different trains. On almost every train... As the train's moving down the track, somebody comes through. Sometimes a young female, sometimes a young male. And I guess they're not allowed to say anything to you, but they put a little piece of paper on your armrest. And if you pick it up, they all say the same. I have a family. I have no money. I need, you know. And they're gone, and three or four minutes, maybe, they come back with their hands out. Sad, sad faces, sad, sad faces. The only problem was every one of these were in their 20s. I I don't think any of them were over 30 years old. None of them crippled. None of them who looked physically unable to work. We saw beggars in two or three places, you know. Young adults sitting down, piercings everywhere you could imagine, begging. No, get up and go to work. You know? No, I'm not giving you my euros that we've worked really hard for. No, 
get your rear end up and go to work. I mean, McDonald's needs people right down the road. They got customers hanging out the door. The point is, it's not always saying yes. With your child, with your grandchild, it's not always saying yes. Our grandchildren learned when they came to our house, there was one set of rules, and when they went home, there was another set of rules. <laughs> Gail's tough. She knows how to do this. I mean, she's read and studied, and uh, she's super nanny, is right. She watches super nanny, and she's, she's got it down. Uh, I remember one of the little ones that spending the night with us one night, and Gail, you know, Super Nanny had said, why don't you, you know, hug them, tuck them in, whatever you're going to do, no more talking. If this child gets up, comes in, you don't say a word. Take them back. Take them back. And you sit outside the door, and every time they get up, you take them back, saying nothing. Conversation's over, day's over, time for you to sleep. It worked. It worked. It's funny when we would take them out to eat, different ones, and sometimes they would say, Grand's rules, our rules. Grand's rules. You don't take food you're not going to eat. You don't go back for more till you eat what you took. Those sorts of rules, you know? Okay, so... So agape is not always saying yes. This child needs to learn. This child needs to grow. This child needs to become responsible. So it's not always saying yes. And the saying no can be much harder. Much harder. No, you're only 15. You're not going to Padre Allen at spring break. No. Okay. This is the point. Righteousness means right standing. And we stand right with God. There's only one way Paul believed. I mean, Martin Luther got his right from Paul's writings. There's just one way you stand right with God. You accept God's gift. And God's gift is love. God's gift is acceptance. God's gift whispers to your deepest spirit, You're my daughter. You're my son. I'm so glad you've come home to me. If you trust, God loves you, you stand right with God. Now, of course, the Wesleys and everybody else since, you know, and before and since, who really understand this have said, oh, but then this love will change you. It will change you, but you don't have to come after you've been changed. You can come before you've been changed, but then you have to let this love change you reorient you, give you different values and direction. And uh, what this, we'll get later to the letters of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, where he says, hey, how can you say you love God, whom you've never seen, and not love your brother, sister, whom you see all the time? If you say you love God, and you don't love your brother, you're lying. That's pretty specific. You're lying. Because to love God and to feel oneself loved by God is to love brother and sister. And Paul's going to tell them, guess what? You've got to expand that family. Your brother and your sister are everybody. It can't be Greeks against the barbarians. It can't be Jews against the Gentiles. It can't be men against the women, adults against the kids. It's all of them. These Italians are my brothers and sisters. So are the Germans. So are the French. So are the people of India. You would have been so proud of our Sri Lankans this week. You know we have four Sri Lankans working for us? We do. Uh, our first one w was the one who's now engineer. Don and his family are, are very devout Catholics. And they said that in Sri Lanka, Buddhists and Hindus have made life intolerable for Roman Catholic Christians. <laughs> and so they, he and his wife, started uh, applying for citizenship, I mean immigration, first to the United States. 
And they waited for several years. Everybody knew they had, had applied and applied, and they waited and waited and waited. And Don tells this story that one day the mailman was coming, blowing his horn, and they're blowing the horn, and they went out to see if he had absolutely lost his mind. He had this letter from the State Department of the United States that finally the letter had come. Okay, so Don started in our housekeeping department here, but we could tell he was bright and responsible. And so uh, we tutored him along, and he took the courses. We got him books to take the courses. He became a licensed engineer. So when our engineer retired, Lee, Don moved up to be engineer. We can pay an engineer more who runs all the heating and air conditioning. But you see, he's been in touch with Sri Lankans, and he tells them how wonderful America is. And so gradually, you know, as we've had vacancies occur, we had a second Sri Lankan and a third Sri Lankan, and now we have fourth Sri Lankan. And two of them had never been through annual conference before. They're so new with us. And so they were here 16, 18 hours a day this week. And they never quit. They never quit. They are also Roman Catholics. They all go right over here to Holy Family Catholic Church. They go to Mass uh, they are they're religious people, committed Christians, and they work really hard. And they have such a sweet spirit, such a sweet, sweet spirit. They're wonderful. So, brothers and sisters, Sri Lankans, hmm? Sri Lankans, one of them, Silva's wife, now teaches in our preschool. She's very bright, very capable, wonderful. They had a new baby back in February, and I went over to see them when he was born, and uh, he's he was in our nursery this week. His mom was helping with all these preachers' kids and lay people's kids that had been brought in, and here was little Charles Albert, Charles Albert Silva, uh, and uh, what a bright-eyed child. I don't think they've said no enough to him yet. Uh, he wants to be held all the time. He wants to be held all the time. I saw different women of ours walking little Charles Albert around, you know, trying to, you know, to calm him down a little bit. But he's a precious child. He looks exactly like his daddy. He's really, really precious. All I'm saying is, Paul's going to get to this. If you accept God's gift, that he is your heavenly father and does love you and does want good to come to you, you've got to expand the circle. Expand the circle. These others are your brothers and sisters. When Don and his wife got citizenship, you know, they took all the tests, they did everything necessary, spent the time required, they became U.S. citizens. Of course, we were going to have a reception here afterward, and, and the housekeeping crew asked. This was before the other Sri Lankans arrived. He was the only one on our staff at that time. And they wanted to decorate the Aldersgate room, which is right next to the information desk, and they got red, white, and blue bunting, and they you know, spread this blue bunting around in red, white, and blue that Don and his wife were citizens of the United States of America. The kind of people that have made this country great, who came here for a new beginning and were thankful for it when they got here. Okay, that's what Paul's struggling with, with these folks in Rome. Let's pick up with verse 8 of chapter 10. The word is near you, on your lips, in your heart. That is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Okay? Our right standing begins with God's gift, and faith is a, a synonym is trust. So if you have faith, it means you trust that God really does love you, loves you. Because if you confess with your lips... Now, this is important, you see. Um, my dad and mother's generation were, the particularly my dad, not my mother so much, my dad, they were the generation, if I told you I loved you the day we got married, and I haven't told you any different, I still love you. You understand? Fifty years later, I still love you. Well, guess what? Most people say, you need to say it. It's not enough you... Feel it. You need to say it. And the other needs to hear it. So here, if you confess with your lips, you have to say it. That Jesus, this is that flesh and blood person, is Lord. 
Ah, Lord, translates, remember, aye, asher, aye, I will be who I will be. You have to confess that the one at the burning bush was and is present in Jesus. And if you believe in your heart, and this is the keystone, folks, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I mean, if Jesus didn't get raised, he's just another good man who died. The resurrection is paramount to Paul. It should be to you and me, too. It changed everything. If you really believe that God was saying, death is not the last word. Death is not the last word. I sometimes say when I pray with families who've just lost somebody that they love, Oh God, a doctor has just said, I did all I could do. And now we need to hear you say, I can do more. I have done more. I will do more for the one you love, too. Death doesn't have the last word. God has the last word. And the last word is not death. The last word is resurrection. The last word is life. The last word is life everlasting, you see. It's crucial. I mean, Paul says later, we'll get to this, if Christ be not raised, then our faith is in vain. Game's over. It all hinges on whether in or not God did raise him from the dead. And our belief is he did. He absolutely did. Okay, so you have to believe it, and then you have to confess it. And that's why before we baptize people, we ask them questions, and they have to answer. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Only one answer is going to work. Yes. Do you believe God really was present in Jesus of Nazareth in a way he never had been before and never would be again except in Jesus of Nazareth? Only one answer works. Yes. Do you believe you can confess your sins to him in your heart, in your prayers, and that he will forgive you? Only one answer works. If I hear yes that third time, is it your desire then to be baptized into this faith? Kneel. Scoop up the water. Baptize. Okay. You need to confess it with your lips. Leave it in your heart. God raised him from the dead. If you believe that, you confess that, you will be saved. Verse 10. Beautiful, powerful verse. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified. Justified, remember, is another word. Used in accounting, where you have to make the Assets and liabilities come out even. You justify your monthly bank statement. Doesn't come out even. You're in a mess. Okay, so if one believes with the heart and God deposits to your side of the ledger, so to speak, it never could catch up with God's goodness unless God deposits into your side. But he is depositing into your side love and acceptance and all these good things. Okay, so if one believes with the heart that this is so, and so is justified by believing, by trusting, these words all mean the same here to Paul, and one confesses with the mouth, you need to say it, and so is saved. Okay? These are wonderful words. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. Remember, this was what scholars called an honor and shame society. It's different from ours today. It meant everything to people, whether they were honored or shamed. You ever see a child hurt himself, herself, and the thing they're most concerned about is, did anybody see me? When they're the one that got hurt. I was here waiting for the wedding to start last night. There was a little boy I've never seen. I think he for sure was a guest at our church. Nine, eight or nine years old, I guess. I had my robe on. I was coming out of the sacristy. And this little fellow had stuck his hands up over one of those radiator covers right there under all the minister's pictures. He's, he's trying to sort of, I don't know what he's trying to do, but that's what he, he, he sort of pulling himself up. And all of a sudden his fingers slipped and his chin went, mm, I heard it. Whomp. And you know what he did first? 
He looked all around. Did anybody see me do something dumb? Did anybody see me do something dumb? And when he was convinced, you know, I didn't look. I saw him walking down the hall. He was really rubbing his chin. I know it hurt. But even more important than that he hurt was that was he going to be shamed? It's been said of people who were hanged, even for the right reason. You know what they were afraid of at the moment they were hanged? They would wet themselves. Shame. That's what shame is. They, or a queen of England, all this stuff that's been in the news, you know. When the blade is about to fall, she said, don't make a mess of this. Don't make a mess of this. Honor, shame. Honor, shame. You will not be shamed shamed by believing in the one who was crucified. See, that's still the big debate in Paul's time. The Messiah of God got nailed to a cross? Come on. Paul says you got to believe it. you got to believe God was willing to go that far, was willing to allow Jesus to be nailed to a cross, because you also believe he raised him. On Sunday morning, he raised him. That Roman cross was not the last word. God had another word that he spoke. As he spoke and caused things to come into being, he spoke and death was overcome by life. Okay, that's what he means. No one who believes in him will be put to shame. And then he gets to this part about the circle needs to be bigger. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. And here he's going to mean, of course... Those who do circumcise their babies for religious purposes, those who do eat kosher, and those who don't submit to circumcision for religious purposes and eat pretty much whatever is put in front of them. God is not judging on those bases. The same, Eye, Asher Eye, I will be who I will be, is I will be who I will be for all. And notice here these beautiful words, and is generous to all who call on him. That's the heart of God, to be generous. Another place we read, you get good measure, shaken down, running over. That's what comes from the Lord's hand. Okay. Everyone who calls on the name of the I will be who I will be shall be saved. Ah, but now he gets to another important point. What are these people in Rome supposed to be doing? He doesn't know them individually. He doesn't know them. What are they supposed to be doing? How are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him Unless they are apostello, they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And that word for good news is uagelion, which is often translated gospel. So what is he saying? If God's done something good for you, why don't you tell somebody? Why don't you tell somebody? If they've never heard, how can they believe? And if they don't believe, how can they ever know themselves set right with God? Somebody's got to tell God's story. I told you back at Easter time, Bishop Woody White is not white. He's an African-American bishop. He preached right here from our pulpit when Bishop Dan Solomon was our bishop. He invited him to come and preach at annual conference. It was powerful. He was in Indiana at the time. He's since come to retirement age, and he's now bishop in residence at our Candler School of Theology at Emory University in Atlanta. Bishop Woody White was saying, Since I was elected a bishop, I've never been asked to preach on Easter Sunday. Because even though preachers dread it and dread it and agonize over the Easter Sunday sermon, they want to do it anyway. If you've ever felt called, you want to preach on Easter. And then Bishop White said, So my wife and I will be in some Atlanta church on Easter Sunday. And I don't want some preacher trying to explain it to me. I just want him or her 
to tell me that story. Proclaim it. That was the word he used. Don't explain it. Proclaim it. Dr. Weatherhead wrote a little book when he was our great Methodist preacher in London back during World War II called The Will of God. It's a classic. It is No one has ever said more clearly and in some ways more simply yet profoundly how do we know when something is and is not the will of God? It's a wonderful little book, and it still sells every year. But then Weatherhead got older, and he, I don't know, maybe he's a little senile or something, but all of a sudden on Easter Sunday, he starts trying to explain the resurrection and how God is so powerful. He focused all these neutrons and protons and all sorts of things, and it just vaporized Jesus. Jay, Bishop White saying, don't explain it to me. Just proclaim it. Just tell God's story. And in February, when SMU was kind enough to name me a distinguished alumnus, after this wonderful presentation by Dr. John Holbert, I had a moment to respond. And one of the things I said was, I'll be forever grateful for Perkins School of Theology. It taught me how to, how to know what I believe. I know what I believe. Uh, and I can tell you what I believe. But I said, now occasionally somebody says to me, have you read this book so-and-so wrote about there's no God, or this book about God's gone away and he's not participating? No, no. I, I, really? I said, no. No, I made that decision when I was 11. I was 11 years old in an old, hot, summertime revival. I felt God speaking to my heart. I remember the preacher his name was Wilson Weeding, visiting preacher. Wasn't a great preacher. Great man. Good, good man. Got to know him much better later. Played football with his son, David. Uh, a good, good man, but not a rafter-ringing sort of preacher. He wasn't a spellbinder. It was just the week God decided to speak to my deepest heart, and he used Wilson Weeding to help him do that. And when I went forward that, that week... And I confessed with my mouth, and I was baptized. I just settled it for me. I mean, I really have not doubted the existence of God, nor the love of God. I sometimes wonder why God didn't intervene. When I ask Him to help somebody, heal somebody, you know, gee, I wish He'd intervened. And He doesn't always. So I don't mean that I don't fuss with God from time to time. But I've never doubted that he was since that time and never doubted that he cares. I just don't always understand exactly why he expresses it the way he does, but I've never failed to believe since then that he's God and that he's love and that his love is for me, but it's also, of course, for you. So how can they believe if they haven't heard God's story? And I said that night down in Dallas. So every Sunday, I go trembling into the pulpit. I think Gail saw something this week that maybe she hadn't seen before in a way. She really wanted me to do well when I preached the annual conference. And I was so grateful to have her right there with me. And know, I mean, I've always known she was for me, but I really felt it. Uh, but she was sitting in the sacristy with me. And the bishop has gone out in the hall. He's speaking, you know, shaking hands with folks. He's, he's not preaching Sunday night, Monday night. I'm preaching. And so I'm sitting there in the sacristy, you know, with my head in my hands, agonizing. And she said, do you do this every Sunday? I said, yes, every Sunday. It hits me about 5 o'clock or so on Saturday. The sermon's written. Friday noon, it's got to be finished as far as I'm concerned. And I've tried to be husband, father, grandfather, Friday night, all day Saturday, Saturday night about 5. It's the bull the next morning at 8.30, 11 o'clock. I agonize. I go over and over every part, but particularly the last two or three sentences. Dr. Ruth Alexander taught me that most preachers explain things far too much. When you figure out the best sentence you've got, say it 
and sit down. My district superintendent told me that after my Sunday night sermon, I've tried all these years to do what Dr. Alexander told me. Don't explain it. When you come up with the best closing sentence you got, say it and sit down. Sunday night, I preached. And I ended, you know, with the best story I thought I had for that occasion. And I said, this little boy, you've heard me tell this story. It was a story I've told here before, but the preachers hadn't heard it. And I was telling about this daddy who took his boy to the big auto show in New York City, got separated from him. And I was preaching, you understand, to the families of those who've lost preacher or spouse of preacher this year. That was the service for all of them. We'd call the names. Bell had been rung for each one, so on. And when the daddy finally finds this little boy, after two hours, he scoops this seven-year-old up in his arms, says, Oh, Benjamin. And he says, Were you afraid? And the little boy says, Not too much. I knew you would come. Sit down. My district superintendent was seated with other district superintendents. And he said, one of the men on the bishop's staff in Oklahoma City said, What? What was that? And another said to him, Think about it. (laughs) Okay. Somebody has to tell God's story. But you agonize, and if you've done all the work you're supposed to do, and now you're trying to remember it, how it fits together... And then you trust that the Holy Spirit, this is Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit will convince folks that it's true. God's story is true. Okay? So that's what Paul's dealing with here. How can they believe they're in Rome, all these heathen, all these pagans around whom you live, if you, nobody tells God's story? Somebody's got to tell God's story. And if you tell God's story, uh, then God's Holy Spirit will convince them that it's true. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel, the good news. All right. Anybody have a question? We didn't cover all that much today, did we? This is a great passage. This is a great passage. As you can tell, Paul says so much, uh, you know, in Next week will be June 10th, and I'm putting down chapter 11 and verse 1. We're not going to deal with a whole lot of verse 11, uh, chapter 11, but there are a few verses that I think are really, really important, and uh, that's where we'll start. Nobody has a question? Well, don't rush off. Uh, Fred Elder is playing the service for you this morning. Fred is our organist and choir director emeritus. Uh, 36 years he gave to this church. I've, I've, you've heard me tell the story that when Gail and I finally moved out of the parsonage uh, about 12 years ago, and the church sold a house and grounds and put the money into an endowment fund, and the income is helping us, you know, build uh, buy our own house. So anyway, as we're getting ready to move, and we've been in that house 20 years, uh, she was saying, you know, every night I got home, can you live without this? Can you live without this? Can you, you know. And finally, one night, it was just almost moving time, and she said, what are you going to do with that closet full of sermons? Oh, boy. I mean, I've, I've written a new sermon every week. I've got them in a manila folder, all my notes, all my notes, everything. But there are very few preachers who can sell their sermons. Not many. There are few. Not many. I said, could you give me a few minutes with that? She said, sure. So a little later, she brushed her teeth and went on to bed. And I went to that closet, and I started carrying those boxes out to the curb. And I stacked 40 years of sermons at the curb and brushed my teeth and went to bed. And the next morning when I went out to get the paper, they were gone. But here's the thing, you see. I thought about Fred. There were only three or four organists who get their DVDs sold everywhere. Most organists prepare every week for a lifetime and they play a prelude and they play an offertory and they play all the hymns and they accompany the anthems and they pour their heart into a postlude 
and it blessed those who were there, or it didn't, and it's gone. You offer it up, and it happened, or it didn't. And a sermon's very much the same. It's something that happened between you and me and God, and it happened well or not well, and was gone. Monday morning, we have to move on. Monday morning, we move on. Well, Fred's playing. Don't rush off if you haven't been to, been to church yet.